Okay. Now is everybody seeing my screen? Yes, yes. 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 Okay. I didn't want that. All right, so we wanna um, again welcome everyone to season four of Environmental Fridays. It is personal. Our website is www.theenvironmentalfridays.com. And we are thankful for some new faces I'm seeing here today. Um, let's keep the word, let's keep spreading the word about um, Environmental Fridays. So <clears throat> this month, April, um, we've gone through at least one um, presentation. It was really good too, um, how beauty and personal products affect our health. Uh, all of these will eventually be up on our YouTube um, playlist and we'll make that available to everyone. Today, of course, we'll be um, going to Trinidad uh, and you'll hear some more about that in dealing with the incorporate environmental science into a high school curriculum. Next week, we go to New Mexico with my friend there, Prestine. We'll talk about some of the environmental challenges um, faced when they were cleaning up uh, some sawmills in Red Lake, New Mexico. And then the last uh, presentation for this month would be by Susan Buchanan, Princella Tobias, about A is for asthma, A for asthma, which is a program and a campaign that actually was is a direct result of this uh, Environmental Fridays series. Um, Princella met Susan here when Susan gave a presentation on air pollution and children's health and they both got together and started collaborating. In fact, right now we're in the process of submitting a grant to the EPA. So that's what we want to see from Environmental Fridays. It's not just talk, but action. Um, and so um, we'll hear about that um, on the 28th of this month. So today, it's a pleasure to welcome another friend um, of mine, Chanelle James. Um, uh, she is the head of sixth form at Bishop Anstey and Trinity College East. She has a master's in educational leadership from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, Trinidad, a diploma postgraduate in education with distinction also from the same University, and she is a physicist. I am scared of you. <laughs> <laughs> Physics was one of my hard classes in college. Anyway, um, she graduated there with first class honors. Um, her experience, her professional experience, includes teacher professional development training, character education curriculum development, and performance management and she hails from Aruka in Trinidad. So tell us something about Aruka. If I want to go to Aruka, what am I like, you know, <laughs> tell me something. To ah, let, let me preface by saying women are not the best with given <laughs> directions. <laughs> However, seeing that um you are familiar a bit with Trinidad, um yes. when you come at the Piaco airport Yes. Uh, you would be heading um north in another direction from the Piaco Airport. And it could say it's about 10 minutes west uh -huh. after you head north the direction for about five minutes. It's very close to the Piaco Airport. I'm not sure if my directions are the best, but I tried. Okay. But what I'm asking is like what is there to like see? What is there to do? What is there special about Aruka? Um, I think one of the things I really loved 
because I don't live Aruka right now, I actually live in Cuba. But one of the things I really, really loved um about Aruka and whenever I visit my mom there is that I am literally at the base of the Northern Range Mountains. Mm. And uh, even though I'm a physicist, Mm -hmm. you would know that I really have a great interest in the environment and I love plants. I I think I may be a little overdoing it sometimes when it comes to plants. (laughs) So actually just looking at the mountains is really, really beautiful. Um, seeing the poe trees in this season as well is something I think anyone would appreciate and love. <laughs> they are blossoming right now? Yes, they are. Oh, nice. Both yellow and pink? Yes, yellow and pink. Uh-huh. Okay. So the scenic beauty of Aruka. Very nice. So it's your turn now to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray, and I have the pleasure of introducing one of my fine teachers at the institution. I will try my best. <laughs> <laughs> so our guest speaker today is Ms. Padmini Ramuta. She is a science educator at Bishop Anne Saint Trinity College East, sixth form in Trinidad. Ms. Ramuta teaches all levels of Cape Biology and Environmental Science and has been an educator for the past six years. She pursued and completed a BSc Chemistry and Biology double major at the undergraduate level at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, Trinidad, and is currently pursuing an MPhil in Chemistry at the same university. Ms. Ramata is very passionate about educating and developing young minds. She implements a unique and resourceful environment that fosters both learning and success within a classroom. She encourages students to appreciate all forms of life and has been passionate about environmental conservation and reducing the severity of man's activity and environment. So without further ado, I hand over to Ms. Ramuta. Very nice. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm just sharing my screen. Thank you, Mrs. James, for your lovely introduction. All right. Everyone can see? Yes, we can see it. It's full screen. Yes. All right. Good. So good morning, everyone. So I have been asked to present on a very passionate topic, being an environmental science teacher myself, incorporating environmental science in our high school curriculum. And I think that this can not only be applied to just high school, but can also be to tertiary levels as well. So let me just give a little background on where we are from, Mrs. James and myself. We are from Bishop Anesty and Trinity College East. We are three schools in one. Very unique (laughs) for Trinidad and Tobago. So we have Bishop Anesty High School East, which is an all-girls school on the left of campus. (laughs) Then we have Trinity College East, which is on the right of campus, all boys. And we have Bishop Anstey and Trinity College East, BATC sixth form, where we are from, which is both boys and girls mix. And at the sixth form level, it's um, around the age group of, let's say, 17 to 19. So we have the big kids. Yeah, a little fun fact uh, from Bishop's. I myself went to the school for seven years. I came from Bishop Anastasi East and also went to sixth form. And Mrs. James was always my principal at the time. (laughs) So our school motto, which we are very proud about and very, very determined to execute, we are selflessly serving our community. And if you know any Bishop's person, we are proud to be (laughs) BATC. All right, so my presentation today, I'm looking at the importance of bringing about or putting in um, environmental science into our education system and what an impact it can have on our young people because what we realize is they are actually the key to the change that we want to see later on. So, We first start by looking at what are the problems here in our society. Right now, um, in terms of agriculture, and I picked agriculture because as a Caribbean national, agriculture is something that we are uh, very high producing on. Yeah, based our economy on agriculture. And some of the problems that we're seeing right now 
is unsustainable agricultural practices. Things like the use of agrochemicals. And when I talk about agrochemicals, I'm looking at fertilizers, pesticides. And we saw that it led to certain things like biomagnification, bioaccumulation, where biomagnification, in case you're not familiar, it's where we have those chemicals that do not break down. They're actually building up in our food chain, passing from one organism to the next to the next. And we being the apex predators, the last one to receive it, we get the bulk of it. And that will in turn affect our health. Then we have bioaccumulation, where we are seeing as our organisms are feeding over time, as we continue to dump these um, fertilizers, these pesticides into our riverways, they are going to be accumulating this in their bodies and you would see their health as well being affected. Um, another thing that we're seeing is eutrophication and that's actually in the picture that we're seeing here. It's where our fertilizers are being washed off into our riverways, into our waterways, and that's causing algae bloom, which is covering our waterways and eventually killing off all our fish, all of our aquatic organisms within there and making that particular habitat null and void. Another issue that we're seeing is um, increased monocropping. So everything in our society right now is about making money, making a profit. And being a Caribbean society, we use a lot of agriculture to make profit. And so we started monocropping. And that's where we are going to be planting one type of crop uh, in mass amounts for commercial use. But when we do that, that particular crop is going to be degrading our soil. It's going to be sucking up all of the one particular type of nutrients, right? And after we've done that, our soil remains barren. It's not able to facilitate any more growth. We have things like overfishing happening right now, where we have a, a growing population and we have to supply protein for them. And so it's not enough to supply that population. Another thing that's happening very prevalent right now is deforestation, which leads to a lot of habitat loss, biodiversity loss, erosion, and making our lands null and void again, not able to uh, replenish or be able to facilitate any more agriculture. Mechanization. Yes, we think mechanization is actually uh, something good for us. It's getting things done faster. It's getting things done more efficient, but it's actually something that causes soil compaction, which is degrading our soil. Soil is to be aerated, but with these big heavy machinery pressing on our soil, all of our soil are compact and is not allowing any oxygen through it. It's not allowing any water to penetrate through it. We have a mass amount of methane production, which is a greenhouse gas. And one of the most potent greenhouse gases we have present, more so than carbon dioxide. The effects of it is far greater. And as a Caribbean, one of our staples are rice. And we love to have, we love to mine. Farming is a big thing here in Trinidad and in the Caribbean. So livestock farming is something that we do, all of which produces mass amounts of meat. We see as well in terms of energy production, the Caribbean in particular, now we have some movement towards more greener means of energy production, but we're seeing that we have high amounts of fossil fuel uses within the Caribbean. And I just um, just put some statistics here for you so that you can see. Uh, so approximately 50 billion tons of greenhouse gases are produced per year. We have an um, increased amount of cars just in Trinidad and Tobago we have, which is a very small island, twin island state. We have 1.1 million cars present on our, our roads right now. And um, that was a statistic taken from 2022, very recently. Uh, we have over 10.91 thousand barrels of gasoline that are being used per day here in Trinidad and Tobago alone, much less the Caribbean or much less the world. And then I looked at abroad and in the US we have over 20.2 million barrels of petroleum being used per day. So the amount of fossil fuels that are being consumed, which is a non-renewable resource, of course, it's great, it's far great. Then we're looking at things uh, in terms of pollution which is a problem here for uh, industrial states in the Caribbean. 
So I looked at some of the statistics here too, and you see that 5.25 trillion micro and macro pieces of plastics are present in the ocean. And every day we have around 8 million pieces of plastics that are being accumulated into our ocean added to it. And then we saw um, in terms of oil spills, because here in Trinidad, we, have, we are producers of oil. And so worldwide, I looked at it, I was interested, and I started seeing that just for this past year gone, we've had at least three large oil spills and four medium oil spills within our world. And those were in places like Asia, Africa, North America. And so we're seeing that there is a problem here in society. There's a problem when it comes to the treatment of our environment. And hence the course for Environmental Fridays by Dr. Murray every week, right? So with these problems, what can be our solution? And being an educator myself, I found the solution to be educating the younger minds about these problems, showing them what is happening in our society, opening their eyes to it. And then they themselves will start because they're young and energetic they themselves will start coming up with the solutions. You present to them some of the solutions that we have already, and then they will start incorporating it into our society. And you'll be really amazed at how passionate they can become about it. So what's the approach? How do we educate these young people? How do we produce environmentally literate generations to come? So I do this in six steps. The first one would be awareness making them aware of what are the issues that are at hand, showing them where pollution is happening, showing them where we are degrading our land, showing them where we're going wrong as a society when it comes to environmental use of resources. From there, you would see they start to become a bit interested. They start to seek a little more information. Now, how can they contribute to a solution? And that's where interest comes in. And within the interest, you start showing them, okay, certain attitudes you might have in the past that might affect our environment today. So for instance, uh, we say, you know, use your lights less within the house. Take it off when it's not in use. But then some students would tell me, well, miss, it, it's just one, one light bulb. Think about all the light bulbs in the world. But if we all taught like that, then a big impact won't be made. But if we all change our thinking, then we would see everybody having the same mentality and everybody taking their light bulbs off. Something as simple as that. So showing them these little things and how easy it is to contribute, they actually become a bit more interested and more self-conscious about what they're doing and their actions. Then we look at evaluation. So they themselves will now start, when you present initiatives to them, when you present different um, opportunities that they can take part in, they will start to evaluate and they will think, okay, maybe I should support this initiative. And they will start taking part now in these little initiatives. So that's where the trial period comes in. Now you wanna make it in such a way that they're enjoying themselves all at the same time. And it's not something too difficult to do because if it's too difficult, then they would start to deter and they wouldn't want to partake in these um, initiatives. But once it's something fun for them, then you would see them coming back again. And so that's where we have adoption happening. So once you have any initiative that is well-planned, well-organized, you will start to see it continuously growing and growing when it comes to public support. And now we have maintenance, a last step, where you continue the initiative. You continue to press forward, spread information, get more support, and you will see a difference actually being made in our society. Yeah, so when I looked at the statistics, because now, Sustainability is such a, a drastic thing in our society where we're now introducing that to our young people, introducing things like environmental science studies to them. And 
the statistics show, and this one was taken from the University of the West Indies, um, with the last statistics at 91% being uh, at 2021. We're seeing over the years from 2016 to 2021 that there are increased amounts of persons participating or heading, well, going towards a degree, a first degree in environmental science, which is excellent. And even if we have students who are not taking part in environmental science, then they will take part in something else, even if it's another career. So, for instance, <laughs> me, myself, looking at chemistry or biology and also looking at the environmental impacts that we can have there. So what is what is the study of environmental science? So it's a subject that we are very proud to have in sixth form. And it's an interdisciplinary branch of science, meaning it incorporates all of our branches. And it looks at the interactions among physical, chemical, bio biological components of our environment. Why do we want to introduce this into our education system? With a particular aim. We aim to give our young people skills and the knowledge that are necessary for them to identify the problems, to prevent them, to find solutions to them, and to also prepare them for taking part in any sort of career that is environmentally related or sustain for sustainable development. So just a little um, intro into what I do. Uh, so at a sixth form level, we have two units. Um, at a unit one level, so six form is two years, at a unit one level, we look at an environmental science, the fundamentals of ecology, ecological principles, sorry, human population and the environment, sustainable use of natural resources. And at a unit two level, we look at agriculture and our environment, both what are the issues at hand and mitigation. Energy and the environment, same all the issues at hand presently and how can we fix them? And pollution, also taking the same approach. So just a bit on what I would introduce to my students, a typical um, syllabus for us. So if we're looking at agriculture and the environment, some of the issues, the unsustain unsustainable um, agricultural practices we things like land take. And when I say land take, I mean clearing land to, to um, practice agriculture and habitat destruction. And all of these things lead to other impacts. So land, land take will then lead to deforestation and deforestation will lead to an increased amount of carbon dioxide within our environment because our plants are not able to take in the carbon dioxide to use. Then once you clear land, you're going to have increased amount of erosion. You're going to have biodiversity being lost. We also have things like pollution in terms of agriculture because pesticides and fertilizers, they also run off when rain falls. Pesticides, they have chemicals that do not break down and they remain present in our foods. They remain present in our soils. And we have waste production that comes from agriculture. We also have soil and land degradation happening. And when I refer to those things, I'm talking about erosion, acidification of our soil, water logging, um, salinization of soil compaction. So all of these things actually prevent plants from reestablishing themselves in our soil. And in bringing it to light to our young people, you would see them being more aware. So when they go to take part in these careers, they will be able to do sustainable practices. The last one that I'll introduce is water degradation, where we're looking at things like sedimentation, um, pollutants being added to our water systems, bacteria from any organic waste that we dispose of within our water systems. So what are some of the solutions that we will tell them? Things like contour farming, terracing, agroforestry, crop rotation, uh, conservation, tillage, sustainable pest management, organic farming. We're going to talk about that today. Hydrophonics, also talk about that today. Post harvest management, waste utilization and minimization, sustainable biotechnology. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about genetic engineering in particular. 
So all of these things we're introducing to them. Then we can look at energy. And what are the issues that are present here in energy? Of course, fossil fuel use. And not only the use of fossil fuels, which are producing our harmful emissions, but the gathering of our fossil fuels, the acquisition. And so you have to mind in order to get it. And that in itself can cause disruption to our vegetation, topsoil. That can also cause pollution when we're digging out substances that are under our earth's surface. So what are some of the solutions? And yeah, we've heard about them, you know, using alternative sources of energy, solar power, wind power. We've heard about them before, coming up as we grow. But here, we introduce the nitty gritty to them. We start looking at how these solar panels work in particular. How do we actually generate electricity using fossil fuels compared to the solar panels? And we look at other forms that they may have never known before. So things like ocean thermal energy, wave and tidal energy, fuel cells, um, geothermal energy. And here in the Caribbean in particular, we have all of the resources that can be used to facilitate these sustainable practices. So if we look at pollution, for instance, we know all the different types of pollutions, air pollution, water pollution, right? So at an environmental science class, a typical class, we would introduce to them what are the sources of these pollutions? Where do we get them? In particular, we look at the Caribbean. And then we start looking at how can we solve this problem? And what we've seen is education is one of the main or key goals to solving this. We look at legislation because the law has an influence on us. We look at technology. How can we treat our water? How can we treat our sewage before we put it back into our main ways? Okay, what's going on? All right, so that's the typical basis of education in an environmental science class that we will look at. And the aim is to really get them to understand what are the current problems, what solutions we have, and how they themselves can uh, maybe improve on the solutions that we have or come up with new solutions that we've not think about before. And just talking to them in the classroom, you know, giving them the theory, it's really not enough. We can get initiatives going and showing them, hey, it's really a big thing and getting them involved, getting them passionate about it. And some of the things that we've done as a school are hydrophonics, aquaphonics. We've done organic farming very recently, um, recycling, beach cleanups, green space, um, which is something that is pending, it's currently going on. And food security and agro-processing, which is something we do a lot here in the Caribbean, pepper sauce making. So I'm just going to go into each one a little bit. So hydrophonics. What, what exactly is hydrophonics since we're talking about it and how you can probably do it at home yourself or introduce your younger ones to it? So hydrophonics is pretty much growing our crops without the use of any type of soil. But instead, we're using some sort of um, nutrient-filled water. And we're passing that through our root systems of our plants, ensuring that they're getting the nutrients necessary. And so they grow from that, no soil, eliminating now diseases from soil that would have come about from before. So what are some of the benefits that we can get from hydroponic systems? One issue here in the Caribbean is land space. Because we are Caribbean islands, we're very small. And so there's a competition going on between the amount of land that we have for housing development and the amount of land that we have for agriculture, since we are very agriculture based. So with the use of hydroponics, it actually can reduce the amount of space that we're using, but still giving us the amount of crops that we need. So we're maximizing the amount of space. Um, it conserves water. So that's another thing. Hydrophonic systems, they tend to recycle the water consistently. And so it helps us with, uh, during the dry season, 
we're conserving our water, sustainable. Then we have uh, all sorts of crops can be grown. And even crops that are seasonal can actually be grown throughout the year if we control the environment and provide all the conditions necessary. So we're controlling the amount of light, controlling the temperature. In a controlled room, we can see crops being grown throughout the year. Um, hydrophonics also require less labor force. It's really a very uh, easy process. Once it's set up, there's really low maintenance present. It's improving our growth and yield. So what we did, and I'll show you a bit of that a little later, we compared growth in soil to growth at a hydrophonics level. And what we've seen is that the hydrophonic system, they actually grew faster because now we are providing that direct nutrients. All that the plant requires, those specific nutrients, we are providing it directly to the plant. And so we're seeing greater yields, growth, growth periods are reducing in time. We're also seeing the use of less agrochemicals. So no more pesticides, no more, well, we have the use of fertilizers, but it's controlled. It's not being washed away into our waterway is causing eutrophication as we saw before. Um, another thing is, plants, they're no longer, and I mentioned this before, they're no longer um, exposed to the diseases that it would have been exposed to at a soil borne level. So no soil means no bacteria that are present in the soil to interfere with our plants. And the next thing is maintaining the integrity of our soil. So without inputting fertilizers, without inputting pesticides into our soils, now our soils are able to heal, they're able to, you know, um, produce hummus, they're able to replenish themselves. So what are some of the disadvantages? Because of course, all things have disadvantages. So one of it is, it's very, it's pretty expensive to start up, I won't lie. It's not do undoable, but it takes a little cost at first. But once you have it set up, it's reducing your cost of producing at a mass amount your vegetation. So another thing is um, you have to constantly monitor the system because it's using pumps, it's using electricity. And so if, for instance, you have a power outage, <laughs> there is, might be a high possibility that your plants could dry out. <laughs> I'm talking from experience as well. <laughs> <laughs> so a little story. Um, my kids and I, we were maintaining our hydroponic system, taking measurements, maintaining growth, and we switched off our pump just for a little bit, just to make sure and, you know, reset, add back water and whatnot. And we forgot to put our pump back on. And an hour after I passed by and I saw all oh, my plants are droopy. I'm wondering what happened, but we, we salvaged them. They're fine. <laughs> I put back on the pumps and they're okay. But in the event that you do have a power outage, that's, that's a big risk. Right? So we explored two types of hydrophonic systems. We looked at the vertical hydrophonics, which is what we call the drip system. And that's pretty much what you're seeing in the diagram. That is a picture of our hydrophonic system that we set up in mid, mid trials. Um, so we stacked some of our containers, one on top of each other, and we had a timer and a pump attached to the top where we had a um, container. I don't know if you can see it, that blue container at the bottom. We filled that with our fertilizers, our nutrient requirements, and we um, connected to our timer on the top. And well, it looks, because we said hydroponics does not use soil. I know it looks like it, there's soil in there, but really it's cocoa peat, which is a coconut husk that we're using. So it's still non-soil system. And once the timer goes off, our our system would um, pull up some of the water and it will drip that fertilized water from top to bottom to bottom. And so it's conserving that water, recycling it, going down the levels. Right, and these are some pictures of our kids setting up their system. They made sure they wash out their stacks, they moisten their cocoa peat, they stack them on top of each other. 
and you can see them planting. Now, with this system, it requires some pre-knowledge. And I'm also talking about that from experience. So if you put the wrong amount of nutrients within your water, there's a high likelihood that it may not be successful. So a little pre-knowledge, a little research is necessary for the particular plant that you're trying to, um, to grow. So for instance, the first time I embarked on hydroponics, excited, I did a, a deep water culture system, just pretty much a big barrel and we're submerging our plant roots into the fertilized water. But I may have made that solution just a tad bit strong. And so <laughs> a couple of days later, I saw one of them sunk to the bottom and I had to go fish them out. And I also saw the others, they were turning color and they were dying because the solution was a bit too strong for them. But we live and we learn. And so we did it again and we were very successful the next time. Right, so you can see them with this system, we must highly maintain it. So we looked at pH levels. We constantly test them. We constantly test our PPM amounts of um, solutes present in there, making sure they're at ideal levels before we allow our system to run. Right, another one that we... Um, attempted was a nutrient film uh, technique. And this one we can actually do in levels as well, but it's more of a, a flat system that we did. And so let me show you what that looks like. So this, these are some pictures of our kids setting them up. It's pretty much where we have a reservoir and you can see that I picked a tree, we put a little bucket um, and we put our fertilizers in there, nutrients present in there, and we have a pump and that pump is circulating the water through our entire system consistently. So our roots of our plants, they're present in there in what we call net cups. So the roots are exposed to these uh, to this nutrient water, and so they're able to grow. So this one is complete water, no cocoa peats or any other substitutes. Yeah, and you can see our kids um, taking part in this. They're building their stacks, they're washing up. They also compared it to soil. And so we planted, we made a little bed and we planted our um, our pak choy, our lettuce. And well, we came up with a little drip system, a little makeshift drip system, where we took our recycled bottles and we filled them up with our water, drilled some holes in them and put them right next to the roots so they weren't dehydrated because during that time of the year, it was really hot here in the Caribbean. Yeah, and this um, one on the left, you can see it's uh, one of the later days and that's how our pack choy was actually growing compared to the soil on this side. So it was really faster, healthier. Yeah, and our kids here are putting them together as well. Yeah, these were the ones in the soil, I think, at the end, right before we harvested. And some of the issues that we were seeing when we did soil, um, when we grew them in the soil, were the pests. And uh, you could see them biting our nice leaves. Mm -hmm. So when we did hydroponics, however, we didn't see this problem. So all those pests that are associated with the soil was eliminated. Yeah, mm -hmm. a nice hydroponic system. <laughs> And this was the lettuce, um, I think, right before we harvested. So we ran this for at least four weeks. And the kids really enjoyed it. They learned a lot. I think one of them has a hydroponic system now in their own home. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so another thing that we um, exposed the kids to, and it was really hard to get pictures for this one, and so they may not be of the best quality, was an aquaphonic system. And this one was done by um, one of our teachers, our HOD, Miss uh, Marissa young -Afun. And aquaphonics, in case you're not familiar with it, it's where we're combining fish rearing in a controlled environment and hydroponics at the same time. Ooh. So fish rearing... Well, fish, they produce organic matter, organic waste. And so we take that, um, that water 
containing the organic matter and we're utilizing it here in the hydrophonics part of it where we're now that becomes the fertilizer for the plants mm. and so they really really enjoy this i remember being i think i was a student then when this was ran <laughs> Yeah, so you can see the entire system set up. The fish that we chose was tilapia, mm. um, with and it wasn't a problem in because here in the Caribbean mosquitoes are an issue. It wasn't a problem because the tilapia would have eat the mosquito eggs. So and this here is a net cup that I talked about, and you're seeing the roots protruding from it. So the roots are exposed to that fertilized water, and well, we put pebbles, we put clay stones. Um, to hold the plant in place. And this is what it looked like um, after. I know it's not a very high quality image, but yes, yeah, so you can see our pond and our hydroponic system running from there. So it's also recycling that water. No pesticides, no fertilizers used, and our kids gained a lot of knowledge from this. Um, another thing that we embarked on, and I did this um, this year, was organic farming. And people tend to overlook it. Organic farming, so we started with composting, compost making. And you can see them here chipping up all of their well, vegetable scraps and putting it into the bucket. Um, they were very enlightened afterwards when it comes to compost making. They didn't realize how easy it was. All you have to do is put them together, leave it there, and nature does its thing. Yeah, so what we really did, we took compost. So we made compost first. That took us about uh, four weeks or six weeks to produce compost. And after that, we did a comparison where I looked at planting using fertilizers and then planting using compost. Now, the difference weren't much in terms of the quality of the plant. However, the only difference that we saw was that the compost took a little longer to grow compared to the fertilizers, which is direct um, input of that nutrient into the soil. So you can see them here cutting up and they were really intrigued, they enjoyed it. Um, they were very excited to participate in it. And some of them even told me that they started compost making at home. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see us here putting together our buckets, we're um, layering them. So some of the things that we use for the layers, we uh, put the vegetable scraps, we put some dry leaves, they went searching for dry leaves over here. <laughs> we put green leaves as well, we put some soil in there to get the microbes present. Um, and we layered that, we did that, put some sawdust, a little coffee, and we layered it throughout until we reach top of the bucket, we moisten it with some water and we left it there. And ever so often, maybe every week or so, we went, we turned it up a bit. And we even took the extra mile and we added some earthworms that we found in our backyards. <laughs> and we added it to the system and that would help with the breaking down of our substances. Yeah, so this was some of the buckets. We made at least two buckets of compost and some of the veggies. You can see some of our sawdust and newspapers. Um, I don't think any dry leaves are there as well. Yeah, and this is where we, uh, you can see one of my students um, mixing the compost ever so often. And then on the left, you would see us actually taking our compost that we've made and now adding it to our soil. And from there, once we've added it, we've started testing our soil contents, looking at the amount of um, nitrogen, of phosphorus, uh, potassium that are present in each one. The difference, we really didn't see much of a difference when we used fertilizers. They were very high, both of them. And we had a really good yield at the end. I think I have some pictures. So with the soil, however, we had a little problem with pests, and you can see that on this image at the right top. And you can see, I think, at the left, where from where we started to where we ended. And um, we grew some tomatoes. <laughs> they were able to carry some home. Yeah, so they had some fun with this. It was a very simple concept, but yet very impactful. Right, so another initiative that we launched and got our kids going. This one was done by Bishop Anstey High School East. 
Um, and so they launch every year, they do a plastic recycling competition where you have to bring in, you have one month and you have to bring in as much plastic bottles as you can possibly co collect. And then we weigh them and depending on the weight, you get a prize. So <laughs> it was actually a really good initiative. Um, this one was carried out by Miss Barry of Bishop Ansley High School. And the results were amazing. It, yeah. We had a lot of plastic bottles being collected mm -hmm. and they were so proud. So you had to wash them, you had to put them in clear plastic bags and then they'll be weighted um, at the end. And you can see that it, it was a really, really successful project. It was really good. Yeah, so all of those bottles will now go to our recycling companies and become recycled and not in our riverways and not on our landfills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our students are here packing their bottles away. <laughs> and uh, so this here is also, um, I think it was the same year that they did. Uh, this was done by the Environmental Science Club of Bishop Ansley. High School East. Another thing that they embarked on was beach cleanups. And that's something we do very often, even at a sixth form level. They go very early in the morning, we gather everybody and we go to a particular beach that we know is very popular here in Trinidad and cleanups are launched and they do an excellent job. This was one that was conducted, I think this year um, by Bishop Anstey as well. And they did a really, really excellent job. They're very enthusiastic. They wanted to take part in it. And so these are some of, just a bit of some of the initiatives that we can involve in our schools and our universities, uh, even in our organizations like church, et cetera, for our young people to be more aware of what's happening and take part in making that change. Right, so something that I would actually like to launch a little, maybe next year. <laughs> um, I'm looking at agro-processing. So one problem here in the Caribbean, we have more importations happening as compared to exports. Mm -hmm. And so we need to become a little more independent when it comes to our food production. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, when it comes to um, preserving our foods now, that may become a next issue. And so we're looking at agro-processing. And so that's where we are planting, taking our products, and now we're creating and preserving these products in um, in form of local, local cuisine that we like. And something very famous here in the Caribbean is pepper sauce, because mm -hmm. we like to produce those peppers. So that sauce making, um, there is something I think in Jamaica that launched, they started making ackee and they're canning them. And mm. I think I saw Kalalua as well being canned. And so now they're introducing that to all parts of the world. And it's really exciting. So what I would like to do maybe next year, um, perhaps get the kids to grow their own produce and then process them themselves and maybe sell them or use them at home. And they can now be introduced into maybe a little business idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I'm just going to show you guys um, some little testimonials. of These are some of my students. One on the left is actually um, a past student. I had her last year, her name is Chelsea Johnson. And the two on the right, the one in the middle is Celeste Johnson and Malaika Rambara. The two of them are current students at Bishop Ansi, well, BATC 6 form. So we can listen to how embarking or taking part in these initiatives can actually, has actually impacted them and what they do at home now. <laughs> So let me make sure that I can share my sound. Okay, so you let me know if you can hear. Hi, good day. Can we hear? Yes. All right, great. This I has Ooh. been very influential to me. Wrong one. All right, start it over. 
Hi, good day. I am a past student of Ms. Ramata's environment science class. In the academic year of 2022, I did an SB with her on hydroponics. So, um, carrying out this experiment, I had the pleasure of learning how to construct a hydroponic system, specific, specifically a vertical hydroponic system. I also learned many things about hydroponics, um, such as it produces a very high yield, it is not as labor intensive, and also it maximizes space. I also learned disadvantages of disadvantages of hydroponics, such as it is the hydroponically grown plants are very um, susceptible to environmental conditions since there is no soil to act as a buffer, and also it is uh, um, the initial cost is very high. All right, so that was Chelsea's here from Celeste. As it has expanded my knowledge oh. on the use of compost. Let me start that one over. This IE has been very influential to me as it has expanded my knowledge on the use of composting as a sustainable agricultural practice, but also teaching me how to make and use compost soil for small scale domestic activities such as kitchen gardens. Doing this environmental science IE with Ms. Ramuta was a very fun and fairly easy process as she guided my group and I throughout each activity very clearly. In our IE, we compared plants that were grown inorganically to plants that were grown organically. And at the end of the IE, we were able to see that the organically grown crops had very little difference to the plants that were grown inorganically. This encouraged me to promote organic farming within my community and my family. As we know, inorganic farming promotes the use of pesticides and fertilizers, which is very detrimental to the environment. So by switching to organically grown crops, it would allow us to create a healthier us, because us humans would be healthier if we eat healthier crops, and we will be the environment itself will be healthier as well. Right, so we heard from some of them, and I'm kind of um, proud of them, glad that they actually take something apart from just trying to pass the exam from this. <laughs> so yes, um, what we've seen as well, while conducting these projects, these little projects, students that were from business classes, other science classes that didn't even think about environmental studies before, they started coming, they were interested, they wanted to take part. I had a business student try to help me to um, analyze the soil content already. <laughs> so it's piquing their interest. When you start to get a bit more physical, when you start showing them and they see the projects in front of them, they, that's when now uh, they start to take that interest. And so we're looking to launch a little bit more initiatives and keep those that we have going um, continuously throughout the years. And hopefully we are making an impact in our society. And hi, that is it for my presentation today. <laughs> Anybody you. has any questions? Thank you so very much. I um, I definitely want to come sit in your class. <laughs> Truly, uh, I'm serious. You're an awesome teacher. <laughs> Thank you. You know, presenting things clearly, great sequence. You give them both theory and practical experience. And one of the questions I have is, I, I know, you know, you, you mentioned it, environmental science incorporates a lot of different sciences. Do you intentionally um, also point out to them or give them exercises in which they look at the chemistry and the biology of what they're doing? So the chemistry of water, the chemistry of the nutrients, the biological aspect, is that part of what you do as well? It is actually one of, so we have something called an SBA where we have to do an assignment that is with at least 20 to 30 percent of their grade at the end mm -hmm. and so that one of the projects that we've launched was um pollution base mm -hmm. and we took them to different um water bodies in trinidad we took samples and then we carried them to the lab and we looked at the contents that are present we looked at the chemical contents 
if there are any heavy metals, pollutants. We also do that with the soil as well. So yes. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Ms. James? I don't have a question, but a comment. Well, what I liked um, is that the projects that we do with the students are projects that you can do with your family, that you can do it in your community. Mm -hmm. They are quite um, simple, but yet yeah, they have a profound impact if we um, take it on board collectively. Um, and as, a, of course, an educator, um, I think for schools to really take this on board, it, you know, it has to be something intentional because one of our um, strategic pillars is actually education for sustainable development. Mm -hmm. So these um these projects outside of actually running the environmental science um subject at Cape level, these products um projects are actually part of our goal for um ensuring that you know the next generation understands uh, sustainability. But mm -hmm. are there any other projects, Ms. Ramato, that you think um, could be um, approached on a family level, a school level, community level that you could share with us? Yes, actually, right now, um, all three schools on the compound, we are looking at, well, making a green space environment. So since everything is technology based and our kids are always, their heads are always in our phone, we're providing an environment for them that is just green no technology, they come, they can sit down, you can have class there if you like, and it's only nature, they're very simple, they can enjoy the ambience a bit, cool their heads a little, yeah, so that's one of the initiatives that we are currently working on doing right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's excellent, I'm wondering if I can get a green space in my community as well. <laughs> I'm not so close to the mountains anymore, but you know, I'm looking at green space in my home, but I think it could be a good community initiative as well. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so other persons have questions or comments? Yes, I'd like to commend Ms. Ramutar very much for the, the, the design of the course. I don't know if you're responsible or whoever, I asked but one question once straight back to this is a long time ago when I first started yeah. teaching. If you know how those students talk to me after miss what happened here on all the time to set the exam. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. We have two persons talking. Okay. <laughs> Gloria, Gloria, go ahead. Yes. Um, I love the fact that they actually get a hands-on experience mm -hmm. because not only they learn how to put it in practice, but it also gets their attention if they're just sitting down with learning 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 theory 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 it's easy to space out and you know the impact of the of the objective of the course is lost mm -hmm. but i have two questions one you said that at the university of the west indies you showed how more and more students are actually studying environmental science at the university mm -hmm. level is this campus just trinidad, trinidad campus or is it university wide that statistic was taken from the St. Augustine campus in particular. Okay. okay. And my second question, do the students have to have had um, the basic sciences at the CXC level before they do this at the A level? Um, they can have some integrated science, but I do have students that do not have all three sciences or have been exposed to all three. So I have students who just did biology and did not do chemistry and they seem to be coping with it quite well because it's uh, just a touch on each one. Okay, okay, thank you. No problem. So my question, next question goes the next way. So at what level, uh, what grade, what form do um, students get first, you know, initially exposed to environmental science, let's say not as a subject maybe, but as environmental science material and content. And is that something in, integrated in the curriculum? I would say at a form one level, we start wow. introducing them. So that's as soon as they get into high school. And then at form three, they start to pick their subjects and one of the sciences um is agricultural science okay. that they can do at a 
a fussy sec and then they go to sixth form and they can pick environmental science as well. Okay. And that's something pretty much across the Caribbean or unique? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Very good. Other questions? I, this is Pat McGo speaking. Mm -hmm. um, right. I apologize for the conflict. I had her <laughs> headphones on and didn't realize that my husband was on another one next door to me. So you were probably, <laughs> that was why. But I, when you were talking about your green space, I thought, wow, here's an opportunity to incorporate the butterfly garden, which mm -hmm. is in the Royal Botanic Gardens, into conservation of, of um, native species mm -hmm. and the butterflies. For if they're sitting there in a green space, it is lovely to watch the butterflies. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend that they go to the Botanic Gardens, have a look at our butterfly project, have a look at the, the native species that we have introduced that will provide the habitat for the butterflies. They might find that that is mm -hmm. useful. But there were other comments that I kind of wanted to make, if you didn't mind, too. That in Trinidad, we have fantastic tides. There's a very strong tide in the Bocas between the islands, and nobody's investigated that mm -hmm. as a form of um, alternative energy. Also, introduce students to the idea of solar panels take up space, land space. We have very limited land space in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I often thought that why don't we do like they do in the likes of Israel and you put your solar panels on the reservoirs that mm -hmm. reduces the evaporation of water from the reservoirs and it also gives you, saves you on land space. Hmm. Right. Um, <laughs> the other thing I thought about was when you're talking about hydroponics, hydroponics can be a raised system. So therefore, hydroponics could be a, a more applicable to farmers in flood prone areas that if they used hydroponics, they might be able to save their crops. The mm. last one that I wanted to make comment about was beach cleanups. I feel very strongly about beach cleanups. Beach cleanups mean, mean that we have failed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That because we should not have if we have to go clean up the beach is because people don't deal properly with mm. their waste. And if we have to deal with an area, so therefore a beach cleanup or any cleanup, to my mind, is um, an education awareness failure on our part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I've mm. said enough for now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, Miss Patricia. But what we've seen is that the younger generations are the ones who are becoming more um, environmentally aware. And the ones who are still polluting, still leaving their garbage and stuff on the um, beaches are a little bit of the older generation. So that change is happening in terms of mentality of our people, but slowly. <laughs> yes, and I would agree with you there. But I remember my eight-year-old granddaughter when we were in Barbados, we were walking along the beach and she handed me a plastic bag and we cut, we, we then cut, picked up the garbage that was on the beach mm -hmm. and put it in the containers at the end of the beach. So that was at eight years old that she wow. handed it to me, not me hand it to her, she handed it to me, mm -hmm. which I thought was really very interesting. Yes. So yeah, that was that was another thing, question or so that I was thinking about. So is it the sense from both of your comments there that the young people, the youth are more environmentally aware than the adults? Or uh, and if so, do, they still need this, the youth still needs focus and information and knowledge, right? I mean, I don't know how to, to really phrase it, but that awareness, or maybe a different word, um, sensibility towards the environment, because awareness suggests that they have a lot of knowledge, mm -hmm. right? I think. <laughs> 
Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, to no, yeah. as you say, it's a kind of sensitivity. Okay. It's kind of maybe an empathy, where okay. you kind of empathize with the environment. More than um, we. You, okay. you, feel, you feel sorry for it, for what we're doing. <laughs> yes. yeah. You know, I, I kind of look at it a little differently. Uh -huh. I think huh? we see ourselves um, as part of the environment. It's not an external mm. thing to us. Mm. Okay, okay. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. and really, really get a, a appreciation and a love for ourselves. Um, and by extension, the mm. generations to come will build that sensitivity where we are only harming ourselves um, when we don't take care of our environment. I think part okay. of the issue is because most often we don't see the effects right away mm -hmm. or we are not interacting or in a particular area, the majority of us, where we are actually um, interacting with, say, the waste or being affected by the pollution. Mm -hmm. So I think that that sensitivity really comes from understanding I'm not separate from my environment. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering too, another question is, you, you know, your school obviously is running a great program. It seems like it's completely integrated into curriculum, into your mission and all of that. Is this, I probably know the answer, but anyway, is this something that is happening throughout the system in Trinidad and Tobago? Um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but our school in particular, we've made it our aim to be a sustainable school. And so we push towards that. Okay, so, so schools get to pick what you call SBAs or whatever projects. So are you saying that other schools are not picking um, like environmental topics? I mean, I guess they have the option, but they... well, well, let me explain from this. This I, I wouldn't say no, because I mean, I'm not very much acquainted with all the projects that are happening, but I know that other schools um, do have environmental science clubs. Okay. All schools in Trinidad may not offer environmental science at the sixth form level. Okay. Um, all schools also don't, in Trinidad don't have a sixth form. Um, okay. However, yes, there, there are pockets of this happening in other schools. Um, once you're doing the environmental science course and you have a school-based assessment, the SBA, right? It would lend to doing these types of projects because it's a requirement. However, um, you would notice based on some of the things um, Ms. Ramata would have shared, there are other ways of sensitizing students. Um, we have we are doing it um, intentionally because it's one of our strategic pillars. However, you can do it through environmental clubs. You can do it through um, different activities. If you want to have a garden at your school, if you want to. Uh, um, and back on recycling and, and a few schools I think um, have recycling projects but if it is for us to for it to be um to me more widespread that would be looking at actually having like um, a sensitization project I think um when I was much 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 younger I don't know if I'm remembering the, the term correctly but I know there's a Charlie little program that basically sensitize the entire population through the schools um, about not littering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, those are those are uh, strategies we could use utilizing our education system. We could also, of course, utilize media, social media, um, to really push um, the mindset or change the mindset of the general population towards the environment. So on that level. Of course, I believe um, if it's integrated in our school system and it, it is continuous mm -hmm. so going, because you also we also have other product projects from WASA at times we'll do projects to get the population sensitized or involved through competitions. Um, you might have the forestry ministry doing doing um competitions as well for students. So we have it, but maybe a more um direct approach might be 
helpful. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I was thinking as you were talking to that, maybe one of the things, so in the United States and maybe other places, but here I know of, um, there's an association for everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. An association for everything. And there are, of course, benefits to that, right? You bring in more resources and all that. So maybe you guys at your school could start an association of secondary schools or whatever that are doing projects, whether it's on the same level or not. But mm -hmm. that would be one way to start trying to like get the word out is to form an association of secondary schools for environmental science or whatever name you come up with that I think would then help to like spread the word. You guys could have competitions. You could, you know, that sort of thing. Um, because yeah, there are, there I've heard of other schools and other environmental clubs. I think like there's a rotary, the rotary, um, mm -hmm. they have stuff. So there, that could be a space in which um, you could pool resources, exchange ideas, have competition contests, and you know get the word out. Yes, I agree. love that idea. I wrote it down. <laughs> okay. I, I think that's a great idea because mm -hmm. one of the main problems in Trinidad and Tobago is. We work in silos. Yes, yes, yes. And this, I mean, there is the enthusiasm out there. You talk to people that if something like that could happen and all the secondary schools or a group of secondary schools talk to each other mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. learn from each other, mm -hmm. then that is definitely the level to go. Thank you very much for that idea. So we will be talking offline, you know me. I follow up. <laughs> we will be talking offline. <laughs> and Pat, you could be part of that conversation as well. <laughs> so the other question I have too is, so you really showed the benefits, especially of hydro, hydrophonics, hydroponics. Mm -hmm. um, has it been scaled up in Trinidad or any of the Caribbean islands? commercialized is it at that level yet it's starting okay so um what we're seeing those younger persons who are interested in agriculture mm -hmm. one of the things that they go towards is the hydroponic system and so uh -huh. i'm seeing more persons now starting it it hasn't it's not at a very large scale per se mm -hmm. but or if they do have it at a large scale there's very few of them in Trinidad in particular. Okay. But they well, have started. Yeah, that's a market sector just waiting to like bloom and blossom. Yes. Just like you were saying about the agri, basically, I guess you're looking at agri preservation business, right? Mm -hmm. your, your idea was? Yes, agri processing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exposing them to more agri processing ideas. Yes. So I have another question. But before I ask it, I want to see if uh, other persons um, have questions or comments. Crystal, Joshua, Tab Tabitha, <laughs> you guys have any comments or questions? Well, yes, I actually have a comment. I'm Kenneth Saunders. Okay. I am. So uh, I am a former student of the TC6 form. I oh. uh, yeah, it's I've left for quite a while now, but uh, I was told about the presentation and I said I had to come mainly because I remember in my time there, I was also part of the environmental club. Uh, okay. <laughs> thanks to uh, actually thanks to Miss Ramuta here because she actually encouraged me to come and join, and okay. at that current point in time, I would say that my interest in environment and those kind of things. It wasn't as high as it is now. Mm -hmm. And I will say that it is definitely something that I believe all the young people in this day and age should get involved in. Because for myself, it, like I said, it left a, a lasting impact. I get upset when I see people like littering on the roads and, you know, you just going out, <laughs> see people throwing garbage. And it's like they don't, they don't fully understand what that's doing 
you know, in the long term, even though it's just one small thing, the long term effects and damages that it can have, you know, and I would say that since then, I have had a brand out and things, even down to the hydrophonics, she explained, when she explained it to me some time ago, I thought it was very interesting. I went and told my mother about it and she was, she wanted to go and get a, a kit like almost immediately. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I just think that is something that it, the young people should definitely get more involved in. And I do see that the young people are getting more involved, at least I'll say around in my neighborhood. I do see it happening. Where's your and neighborhood? I think I'm in Trin City, not Trin too City. far. Not Actually, not too far from the school, yeah. Not okay. too far okay. from the school. Okay. And I think, it's a, I think it's a good thing because what is happening is, like Ms. Ramutan mentioned earlier, you can see more and more young people getting involved in it. And as such, since you have more young people getting involved in taking care of the environment, getting involved in all this agribusiness and everything like that, you can actually at least slowly but surely see like outrage if there's people not taking care of things properly and a completely shift, a complete shift in the dynamic of how we as Trinidadians in particular are taking care of our nation. I just thought I should make the comment because I thought that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important because I don't know what you do now, um, uh, but like you, everyone doesn't have to be an environmental scientist or have a career in it, but the sensibility, the awareness, the impact of be, you know, of being environmentally aware and being proactive is something that's part of like a nation a nation's like um, citizenship and stewardship mm -hmm. of the environment. And if if you leave Miss Ramata's class with that sense mm -hmm. that you know you 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 now know how to take care of our nation, that alone is like really important. Okay. So I, I have. Uh huh. <laughs> I was just saying I agree with you. That's in the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I have one other question too. So for a long part of our history in the Caribbean and stuff, sugarcane was a monocrop. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back to Trinidad and traveling around and stuff, I noticed that a lot of and now it's not really, especially in Trinidad, um, but I noticed a lot of the land that used to be sugar fields, sugar cane fields, are just left there, mm -hmm. not like being done. Is it because of some of the things you said, the, land, the soil was degraded or just we haven't gotten around yet to trying to really figure out what to do with, I mean, it's a lot of land just... Mm -hmm there not being used in any you know in any way profitable way or, or so i think it's a combination of both because those um sugarcane fields were more like the carney area yeah if i'm mm -hmm. not mistaken and mm -hmm. well the carney area floods very badly so persons investing in agriculture at in those lands might not they wouldn't want to mm -hmm. so that might be a problem because mm -hmm. the Karani River is right there and it bursts pretty often. Mm -hmm. and it's really bad <laughs> during the rainy season. So that could be that can be one of the reasons. Um and in terms of the fertility of the land, yes, that can also be another thing. Because what we used to practice here in the Caribbean is a slash and burn, and we still practice that here where we cut down everything and we burn it. Mm -hmm. And it's it also degrades our soil. It's really not good for our environment. And so it leaves the land in that state. When you came, when you saw it, did it have a lot of vegetation present on the land? Uh, some places did, but some, and some of the places that I'm talking about is a bit away from the river. I think mm -hmm. places like Princess Town and other places that there were oh. like actual sugar mills and you have oh. sloping you know, hills and stuff. Uh, I think I think that is a clear case of the dangers of monoculture. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that legacy basically is still going on. And 
is yes. the ministry is the ministry trying to do research or whatever to maybe be able to put different um, crops there? Multi -crops, Karen, not mono crops. Karani Karani did before they closed up okay. um, that they did have uh, uh, tree planting and they they planted orchards. Oh, okay. And um, but basically, I think you're going to find. Or what we are finding now is that a lot of the land that used to be sugar land is now being taken up by housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw and that. This is a, this is another sad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. I, I do have because... a comment on that, okay. and that is that this it is true that a lot of the housing has been well, a lot of the housing is used to be agricultural land. However, mm -hmm. I do know at least. As of recent, I saw that the government, uh, they were trying to basically encourage more agriculture in for the younger people, for basically anybody, actually. Um, mm -hmm. They would say, okay, we would give you uh, a plot of land. We would put a house here because housing is very difficult for the young people at this day and age as well. So they would say, we would give you housing, but we would also give you a whole, like, almost like, I don't know how many acres, but it would be quite a lot of land to do farming, I think, because they're trying to encourage young people to get more into farming, more into producing uh, locally grown crops instead of always having to import things from outside. Mm -hmm. well, that's really the under, under those circumstances, how do you justify government taking St. Augustine nursery land, which is prime agricultural land, and put it in for mass housing? Hmm. That one, I did not agree with that one. That one I also thought was very <laughs> awful at the end of the day. Yes. It might be due to the university presence in St. Augustine as well. Yeah. Lots of persons come down to that area. Yeah. All right, guys and gals, <laughs> thank you so very much. Um, two of my friends, uh, Chanelli. James and Padma Ramuta, thank you for co-hosting. Thank you for being a guest speaker. Thank you for generating interest. And um, I hope you all the best in continuing to have an impact. And you have evidence okay. <laughs> on this program with Saunders, Mr. Saunders, that what you're doing is actually making a difference. And as I said earlier, I will be talking to you guys offline about that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Great so episode. Loved it. All right. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. You too. Okay. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. <laughs>